analogizing normal behavior to support the pharmaceutical industry by a group of psychiatrists who are claiming that they are the wizards of the brain and trying to make it seem as if they have science behind them when you look at the actual studies. And I have studies here showing that there is no brain biochemical imbalance they can prove. It's purely subjective. But also, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, many of them, the schools are advocating now teen screen. And I can promise you, any teenager in the United States who takes this test could be then diagnosed as having a mental disorder. So, quote, we can get ahead of the curve and diagnose mental illness when it's young so it can be properly treated, i.e., drug them. I'm concerned about this. I'm, I'm looking at now and seeing they pathologize women. They made menopause, PMS, and pregnancy a disease. Mm -hmm. Now they're pathologizing being a young person. Your thoughts, please. And by the way, no one in the federal government at any federal agency is opposed to this. No one at this American Psychiatric Association is saying the DMS-4 is a comic book. You know it. I know it. Anyone who's got a brain in America knows the DMS-4 is a fraud. Why can't physicians, pediatricians, psychiatrists, and psychologists acknowledge it? What the hell is wrong? Have they just become a mind-think cult? I'm very concerned about this. In the late 60s and early 70s, scientists were pushed to find causes of social unrest in individuals, particularly in their brains, in their minds. Um, at that time, there was a lot of experimentation with implanting electrodes in the brain, which had come out of uh, some Spanish research uh, in controlling bulls in a bull ring with remote controls. And one of the cases that came to court about this was written into a novel by Michael Crichton in the, in, under the title The Terminal Man. It was based on a real case. It was a court case that I actually witnessed in Boston, Massachusetts with uh, Harvard and, and uh, um, MIT scientists testifying on both sides. Um, at that time, Ritalin was first prescribed for children with what was called minimal brain damage, MBD at that time. Now it's attention deficit disorder because there never was any brain damage. Uh, minimal brain damage was defined as brain damage so minimal you can't detect it. I mean, they literally defined it that way. It, it sounds laughable, but it's true. And I was part of a research study at Mass General Hospital um, where I was doing research at the time to test a remote viewing, uh, a remote TV system where they could have uh, a patient come off an airplane, let's say at Logan, Logan Airport, and be seen by a doctor at Mass General Hospital and diagnosed, and then there were prescription writers and stuff. This was early technology of this kind. And I was asked to work with some kids. And I thought this wasn't going to work because the technology would interfere with good communication. But children were already growing up with television sets, and they would talk to their TV sets, and their TV sets never talked back. And I discovered that kids would tell you anything when you were on a TV screen, and they could actually communicate back and forth with you. And I always told the kids, first, right at the beginning of the session, you can turn me off with that left-hand knob on your set if you want. No one ever turned me off. This was fascinating to them. And I had kids literally show me how they played schizophrenia for their parents and doctors to get certain kinds of attention and stuff like that. And I got several kids off Ritalin by talking to their doctors afterwards about these communications. And by the way, the technology did not get in the way at all. One of those kids mailed me a handwritten note saying, Dear Doc, thanks every much for being my head doctor. Love, Joey. I talked to them as equals, you see, and it, it created a different kind of relationship where you can get at what the problem is in the kid's life. Sma smashing them with Ritalin or something like this isn't going to do it. But the original motive for all this research was to pin social ills on individuals' inadequacies, damages. And I must say that the major religions of the, of the uh, Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, um, and Muslim religion, 
all have made people feel inadequate under authority. And I think they've gone tremend done tremendous damage to our human species in that we have become incapable of standing up for ourselves, of believing in ourselves, of having the required self-esteem, and the, and the love of each other to work with each other in building the sustainable world that's now called for. Children are not benefiting from these drugs or from these labelings of ADD. The original motivation for that kind of medication was in connection with trying to show that uh, social ills were really caused by individuals who had something wrong with their minds, their brains, and now it's just become, well, attention deficit disorder. Now, how can a child in this culture not have some attention deficit disorder if it's been watching television, which is all sound bites and rapid fire uh, music and jiggly stuff and, and uh, never a thought that holds for over a minute? Um, our minds are being programmed into video game kinds of frequencies. And already, ooh, 10, 15 years ago, I know Mexican psychiatrists did a study of children playing video games and found that the frequencies that were going on in their brains while they were playing persisted all night in their sleep. So we probably are damaging kids' brains, but in a completely different way from what the doctors think is the problem. And the answer to it is get them outdoors, get them healthy food, uh, get them into reasonable dialogues, teach them holistic thinking, give them contact with Mother Earth and with, with other species, um, talk to them about evolution. There are wonderful things that you can do with children in a world to prepare them for having to rebuild a whole world. And the drugs are just not there. All that that's going to do is to make more docile creatures, probably, who either commit suicide, which is another indicator of a dying civilization, and is happening not only significant numbers, but ever rising numbers, suicides, murders among children. Uh, the, this is the youth letting you know there's something very, very wrong at the very heart of your culture and we need to encourage them to change it, to let them change it, not to stand in their way with endless, oh, the authorities say it has to be done this way. Encourage their creativity, encourage them to think, encourage them to holistic health care, to holistic thinking. Probably the biggest stress a sick person faces in, the, in our society is the healthcare system itself which is going to make them wait endlessly in long lines and fill out tons of paper, and then you get five minutes with the doctor who then has to spend 15 minutes filling out forms about you, and you're shuffled for this test and that test and up and down to the x-ray room and, and uh, the basement and whatever. Uh, it, it's a very stressful thing just to get diagnosed and treated in our healthcare system. And that's just symptomatic of the entire lifestyle that we lead nowadays, where we're ruled by clocks and you have to be here and there. And parents have become chauffeurs for their children. Uh, no, no child can walk anymore. But again, you see, you have to look at society holistically. If the streets aren't safe, then you can't send your children out into them. What made our streets unsafe? Why don't we have neighborhoods where people are looking out for each other and where they recognize strangers coming in? Um, we've, we've almost made entertainment out of uh, child seduction on the internet. Um, it's hugely stressful, and kids are growing up at machines doing these agile thumbs, my grandchildren call them, games, um, and uh, watching television shows that are constantly interrupted for commercials. And it's just, yes, it's a high-stress society. How do we calm down? How do we find the time? People have to do time analysis on how they're actually spending their time and noticing that maybe it takes longer to take your family to McDonald's and to get your order in and to wait and to, to eat than it would have been to prepare some delicious simple meal out of simple food at home. 
my grandchildren grew up microwaving all their food and then cooling, uh, cooling it, taking it out of the freezer, putting it in the microwave, and then putting it back in the freezer because it was too hot and stuff like this. Uh, and I used to say, don't you know that you can make oatmeal in a pot on the stove in three minutes? <laughs> you know? Uh, what do you do? How do you slow it down? We have to look back at were the old practices that we think we're being more efficient about actually less efficient um, than what we do today? There, are, we, We've got to look into it. We've got to find out what we spend our time at. Can we give up that last TV show at night and instead read an inspirational book or just turn the light out and talk to yourself in the dark about what the day was like? and and uh, counting your blessings, uh, thinking positively. I've been accused of being too much of an optimist. Well, I'm trying to balance huge amounts of pessimism out there in the culture. I think people are exhausted, frightened, overstressed, and that all of that needs to be reconsidered. Is it necessary to live that way? Not on your life. We're very worried about healthcare systems and how much they need to be reformed, but how much are we talking about why we need so extensive a healthcare system in the first place? What is it about our lifestyles that makes us a rather unhealthy population? Is it just because we run to the doctor with every little sniffle when people didn't do that in the past? Or is it because we actually are sicker? Is it because of our toxic environments? Is it because of the toxins we put into ourselves? I mean, I understand the average American body is now classifiable as low-grade toxic waste. And in the uh, Arctic, the Inuit women are forbidden to nurse their own babies because toxins tend to pool at the poles because of the way the climate system works. And so the further north you get, the more toxins there are in the food chain, and their milk is so toxic that they aren't able to nurse their own babies. Now, that should be a huge canary in the coal mine for all of us to realize that. And of course, the planet's getting hotter at the poles faster than it is in our more temperate climates. We've got to wake up and look at our lifestyles and figure out how to keep ourselves healthy. We've got to build more trust in our own bodies. We have to teach our children that their bodies are recreated in every instant from the particle level up and more slowly at the molecular level and more slowly at the cellular level when things get replaced. But after a certain number of years, you are a whole new you. Your body is constantly recycling all your molecules, recreating itself from the bottom up. It's an intelligent system doing that, and we don't value it. How many of you thank your 100 trillion cells every morning or every night before you go to sleep for having sustained you through that day? It's an amazing, amazing piece of evolution we all walk around with, and we could keep ourselves far more healthier than we are. I haven't uh, had to have any kind of, of normal health care uh, in 25 years now because I decided that I would trust my body to be able to heal the aches and pains of getting older, and I'm in better shape now than I was over when I'm over 70 than I was when I was 50. So I know it can be done, and I've seen all the studies that show, as you talk about, changing to a healthy lifestyle almost eliminates the need for doctors and hospitals, doesn't it? <music>